What's up guys and welcome to the long-awaited review of the new AMD Radeon 7 graphics card which AMD sort of announced at the beginning of the year and now we actually have it in our hands to test. Now what I've been doing is running a bunch of tests on the RTX 2080 because the question that you might have in your head right now is, Paul, I've got about 700 bucks to spend on a graphics card. Should I buy the 2080 or the new Radeon 7? This video should help you decide. Excellent! Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace. Click the sponsor link in the description to save 10% off of your Squarespace order or wait till the end of the video to find out more. This is an interesting graphics card. It was somewhat unexpected. AMD was expected to announce a bunch of seven nanometer stuff at CES this year back in January, which they did. But the next generation architecture for the GPUs that they're working on is called Navi. This is not a Navi based GPU. It is still using the Vega architecture, but they've shrunk it down to the seven nanometer manufacturing process. And what that has done is provide them a lot more space. As you can see, the previous die area for a Vega 64 was 495 square millimeters versus the updated Radeon 7 GPU. GPU, which is 331 square millimeters, that's provided them a lot more space to put four stacks of HBM2 memory with four gigs on each stack, giving you a total of 16 gigs of HBM2 memory on this graphics card. That's a lot, and actually significantly more than you can get on any consumer level graphics card, whether you're talking about HBM memory or GDDR5 or 5X or 6. You might even argue that it's too much memory for what today's games actually use, but AMD has done their best to make a point that games are using more and more memory every day and higher resolution resolutions use more memory, so you might actually be able to make use of all that HBM2. That's, and they're sort of pitching this as a crossover production content creation card, so the HBM2 memory might help you there as well, depending on the software that you use. AMD also says that they have added more thermal sensors integrated into the GPU die itself so you can actually get more accurate temperature reading. In fact, they're basing their performance boost functions like uh, automatic throttling of the GPU frequency on the edge temperature versus the junction temperature. This also allows them to throttle the fan speed. So according to their measurements, they got about 2% more performance by measuring the edge temperature. Although the junction temperatures they're listing here are also significantly higher. Now I have already gotten some feedback from some other people I know who have tested this card, the temperatures might potentially be an issue depending on the card. We're still waiting for more feedback on that, but that's going to be one of the things I'm testing immediately when I install this here is what kind of temps we're getting out of this card. As for specs, the Radeon 7 uses the Vega 20 GPU that's based on the 7 nanometer manufacturing process as opposed to 14 nanometer. has 13.2 billion transistors in there, but a shrunk down die size of 331 square millimeters. You're going to get 60 compute units compared to 64 that you get with the Radeon Vega 64. So even though that is down and you're going to get fewer stream processors as a result, 3840 versus 4096, you get much higher frequency. In fact, the boost GPU clock is at 1750. Peak should be about 1800 megahertz out of the box, and that's a good 200 megahertz plus frequency boost over the Vega 64. This also means your GPU compute performance is up to 14.2 teraflops. You get 64 ROPs, you get 16 gigs of HBM2 memory with a total memory bandwidth of one terabyte per second and a 4096 bit memory interface. Board power is only up five watts to 300 watts versus the Vega 64's 295. I didn't do an unboxing video of this when the unboxing embargo lifted earlier this week, but I already kind of showed you guys this when I saw it at CES for the first time, but a quick once over of the card shows you that it is a very minimal design, very simple. It has a squared off metal shroud with a nice bevel around the edge that uh, shows a little bit of an accent, although you have sort of a powder coating over most of it, so it's not too reflective. Three 92 millimeter fans at the middle and a very substantial fin stack array underneath them. And the fin stack actually raises up on the sides here so when the fans are spinning it's pushing air out across those uh, as well as down and over them. There have been some teardowns done on this card already. There is a graphite pad between the GPU itself and the HBM2 stacks and the cooling solution. It uses 10 millimeter flattened copper heat pipes to help uh, move some of the heat away from the hotter areas of the card and it has dual 8 pin PCI Express graphics power connectors. Also of note is that this card is not crossfire compatible so you can't connect two of them up at the same time for crossfire which is kind of sad because I would have been sort of interested to see what two of these did versus like a 2080 Ti. Also missing is a built-in BIO switch, uh, which AMD has done on reference design cards in the past. So that's kind of sad that it's not there, but you can still of course go in and adjust everything using third-party software or the AMD software as well. The shroud itself is also pretty easy to remove, especially if you compare it to the Founders Edition cards from Nvidia. And finally, for display outs, you have three full-size display port as well as an HDMI 2.0. Also of note is that those are all in a single row, which means means if you did want to water cool this, you could get it down to a single slot solution. So I have waited long enough. I am ready to install this in the test bed and see how it compares to the RTX 2080. That's the Founders Edition, by the way, which I'm 
I'm comparing it to because it is literally the only RTX 2080 that I have. So that's what we're going with. Stock out of the box frequencies for both cards. The processor I'm using is the 9900K 8 core 16 thread processor from Intel, which is running at 4.8 gigahertz. The motherboard is the ASRock Z390 Tai Chi Ultimate. For memory, I have 16 gigs, two 8 gig sticks of G Skill Trident Z RGB memory that's running at 3200 speed, cast latency 14. For my main operating system drive, I have a Samsung 970 Pro 512 gig NVMe SSD, and the CPU is being cooled by a Cooler Master Master Liquid 360R 360 millimeter radiator all in one liquid cooler. For some extra game storage, I have a SanDisk Ultra 2 one terabyte SATA SSD. Everything is housed in this Lian Li PC011 Air Dynamic Chassis, the Debauer Edition in white. There's a 650 watt EVGA 80 plus gold rated power supply powering everything, and I'm running everything in this test system as you see it here with the side panels on and everything in order to get temperature measurements. With all that said though, here are the benchmarks. Actually, let me install this first. So first off, let's run through a set of productivity tests, and these were run with SpecView Perf 13. This is a popular CAD and CAM visualization and digital content creation test suite uh, that uses applications for that type of thing. Starting with 3D Studio Max, this is version 6, and it's running at 1920 by 1080. Here, the RTX 2080 starts out with a pretty commanding lead and a score of 237.1 FPS. Remember, higher is better here. The Radeon 7 comes in with 168 0.3 FPS when rendering this test. Next up is the CATIA test 05, and here I bumped up the resolution to 4K, or 3840 by 2160. Here the Radeon 7 takes a pretty healthy lead with a score of 159.5 FPS, and that outpaces the RTX 2080's score of 86.2. The next test in the suite is Creo 2. This is also running at 4K, 3840 by 2160. And here the RTX 2080 again takes the lead with 164 FPS average frame rate. The Radeon 7 meanwhile has a score of 105.3 FPS. And the final test I ran from this suite is Maya 05, again running at 4K, 3840 by 2160 resolution. And here we're a little bit closer between the two cards, but the RTX 2080 took the lead with 180.8 FPS compared to the Radeon 7's 159.8. So the Radeon 7 was only able to win one out of these four tests. Moving over to gaming tests, and I'm starting out with the several synthetic tests from the 3D Mark suite, starting with 3D Mark Fire Strike Ultra, which is a 4K test, DirectX 11, and here the Radeon 7 took the lead with a score of 6,697 overall, and that's due to the graphics score of 6,792, compared to the RTX 2080 Founders Edition's score of 6,245. Next up is 3D Mark Time Spy Extreme, which is also a synthetic test, this time using DirectX 12, also running at 4K. The RTX 2080 wins this time with a score of 5,155, and that's beating out the Radeon 7 score of 4,376, with a graphic score of 4,268. That is 900 points behind the RTX 2080 Founders Edition score. Can't quite tell why it's not performing as well in the DirectX 12 test. I was hoping to do some ray tracing testing with the 3D Mark Port Royal tests, but unfortunately the drivers I have for the Radeon 7 aren't currently compatible, so it would not run. We'll have to save that for a future date. But I was able to run VR Mark Blue Room, and there we got a score of 3,537 for the RTX 2080 Founders Edition. That is again a healthy 900 point lead over the Radeon 7 with a score of 2637 and a frame rate of 57.5. So when it comes to VR, in this test at least, the RTX 2080 has a healthy advantage. Moving into some actual games, and I'm testing at 4K, 3840 by 2160, as well as 2560 by 1440 to get a couple scores for each test. For Ashes of the Singularity Escalation, which is a DirectX 12 test, the RTX 2080 Founders Edition wins once again with a score of 63.2 average frames per second. The Radeon 7 came in with 53.3 average FPS. When we look at 2560 by 1440 scores, the Founders Edition wins once again with 69.8 average frames per second compared to the Radeon 7's 60.7. Next up is Shadow of the Tomb Raider. This is also running in DirectX 12 mode. At 3840 by 2160 4K, the 2080 Founders Edition wins just by a little bit with 47 FPS versus the Radeon 7's 45 FPS. And if we move it over to 2560 by 1440, the RTX 2080 wins yet again the score of 90 average FPS compared to the Radeon 7's 82. We have disappointing results for the Radeon 7 once again in GTA 5 at 4K 3840 by 2160. It scored 66 average FPS compared to the RTX 2080's 
76 average FPS. And at 2560 by 1440, the Radeon 7 managed 118 average FPS compared to the RTX 2080's 139. The Radeon 7 did manage a win when it comes to Battlefield 5. I am running this in DirectX 11 mode because I was having some difficulties with DirectX 12 and I needed to get the benchmarks runs. So at 3840 by 2160, the Radeon 7 got 69 average frames per second. That's about 5 FPS more than the RTX 2080's 64. And then again at 2560 by 1440, we had 117 average FPS for the Radeon 7 compared to the RTX 2080's 107. And my final test here is Overwatch at 4K 3840 by 2160, and this is at epic settings. We have 93 average FPS for the RTX 2080. That is more than the Radeon 7's average FPS of 87. And then finally at 2560, by 1440, we have 175 FPS average for the RTX 2080, and 165 average FPS for the Radeon 7. Now, if you're wondering what frequencies these cards are running at, the Radeon 7 has a base clock of 1400, a listed boost clock of 1750. I found that on average it was running at about 1800 or 1807, and it peaked at 1823 maximum frequency. I didn't dive into overclocking for today, unfortunately, I didn't have time for that, but that is compared to the RTX 2080's frequency of 1515 base, 1800 boost, about 1905 on average, and 1980 peak. Temperatures are what we need to talk about next, and with the Radeon 7, temperatures are weird. In the reviewer's guide, they list that there are a bunch of different thermal sensors on the actual die, and they have they have what they're calling edge sensor temperature reading and junction sensor temperature reading, and the junction te sensor temperature reading is much higher. It also seems to be what most third-party apps are picking up. So looking at Hardware Info 64 that I use pretty often, I was seeing GPU temperatures that would go up to 95 and then 100 and then all the way up to like 111 maximum, which is way too high for a GPU temperature to be. However, if we're talking about a GPU temperature that we're not used to seeing, then maybe that is okay. If you look at the edge temperature, and that is what the Radeon Wattman utility was reading and showing most prominently at least, uh, those temperatures were much more reasonable. I was hitting around 65 to 70 degrees Celsius on average, maybe peaking at 72 or 74 degrees at max when under a heavy sustained load. Now since we don't have any other 7 nanometer GPUs to compare this to, we probably need to wait for third-party monitoring application developers to sort of catch up to the technology that's built into the Radeon 7. For now, I'm going to set that aside. I'm hoping that that high temperature that we're seeing isn't actually like comparable to an old-school GPU temperature. I think that's just something else that we need to take into account now, but that remains to be seen. The one thing that I am able to test is just what it actually sounds like when under peak load. Unfortunately, it sounds like this. This is my informal sound test. It's just running Time Spy Ultra right now. I will tell you, that is loud. It's a bit louder than I would want it to be, especially for a card with a massive cooling solution. And compare that to this when there is no load on the GPU. So unfortunately when compared to the Founders Edition RTX 2080, and especially when compared to aftermarket coolers that I have tested, this is a loud card when under load. That could probably be mitigated by adjusting some settings somewhere. Unfortunately, the follow-up to that is that there are some bugs going on with the software and the drivers so far. I encountered a few different issues, including the game freezing entirely while trying to test Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Uh, I was able to get it to unfreeze and sort of restart the test, but then it would happen again. I was finally able to get it to work by closing down Watt man, but then I didn't have monitoring going on in the background, so that's not good. I also had a situation in Overwatch where everything just kind of turned blue. I, I have no explanation for that. I, I didn't really dive into it, but it ended when I closed the game. And then my final complaint, I guess, would also be going back to Wattman and that there are different temperature readings. There's supposed to be a chart across the top that you can scroll over to sort of see your history and what frequencies were there, but that wasn't updating at all. Uh, and then there's different temperatures. So you can see the junction temperature and the normal GPU temperature, but then further down, there's another listing for the junction temperature and the GPU temperature, and that's not the same as what it says up above. So the software definitely still needs some work as well here. So in closing, you might be thinking to yourself, well, it's not quite as fast as the RTX 2080 for the most part, but uh, it seems like it's cheaper too, right? It's only 700 bucks compared to the Founders Edition RTX 2080, which is $800. However, there are RTX 2080s, uh, third-party add-in board manufacturer designs for it, which are selling and available right now for 700 bucks. So this really should be an equal comparison of two G GPUs at the same price. And unfortunately, the Radeon 7 just isn't stacking up to what the RTX 2080 is currently able to offer uh, when it comes to both frame rates as well as noise. 
Add to that that NVIDIA has recently opened the floodgates for FreeSync monitors that can work with G-Sync GPUs, and you also lose the former advantage that Radeon cards have that you could pair it up with a less expensive FreeSync monitor. That is no longer the case because those FreeSync monitors now also work in, with NVIDIA graphics cards. So I think the Radeon 7 is going to remain kind of a niche product for people who really like Radeon products, I suppose, and I think there are going to be some edge cases, some specific use cases that actually make use of tons of video memory that it will be useful for when it comes to the production side of things. But since those cases are kind of more niche and more specific, it's gonna be up to you to decide if it works for you, if it happens to be better at the certain games that you wanna play or at those specific applications that you want to use. Speaking of applications you might want to use, I have been using Squarespace recently, actually for the past few years, to power my store, paulshardware.net, and you guys should also try out Squarespace if you want to put together a website. I have a link in the video's description, and you should check that out. Squarespace basically helps you do the internet better by helping you set up a website. They have templates to help you get started with responsive designs so you can get your website looking good, whether it's on a cell phone or a desktop or any other device. So whether you need a website for your business or for a hobby or for anything that you might want to create a website for, Squarespace is good for creating that website. They have 24-7 support via live chat and email, and they have commerce functions available so you can integrate products to sell and set up a store just like mine at paulshardware.net, especially if you have super sweet merch to sell, like I do. So click the sponsor link in the description or go to squarespace.com slash paulshardware. You will get 10% off of your first purchase, and a big thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring my YouTube channel. Thank you guys also for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it and learned a little bit more about the Radeon 7 disappointing though it may, may be, it is at least a little bit more competition for NVIDIA when it comes to the high-end graphics card space. Really would have been cool if they had included Crossfire though, like a two-way situation with one of these. Might have actually been somewhat interesting. That's all the time I got for now though guys, hit the thumbs up button on your way out and we'll see you in the next video.